Hello, everybody. How's it going today? You guys hear me okay? I'm usually known to be super loud, so yeah, it's great. Um, okay, so uh, I will be talking about um, continuous story of Erlang type systems. Uh, there will be obviously a lot of discussion about dialyzer in here. Uh, there will be discussion some stuff pre-dialyzer. There will be some discussion stuff uh, kind of going forward, things that we can look at in the future for type systems. And uh, to be upfront about this, there's so much to cover. I could have covered, like when you think of like, uh, here's a, an early uh, paper on type systems at Erlang. It also means there's like a hundred other papers that it takes from uh, that we just can't cover all. Uh, but maybe if you want to stay after lunch, we can, uh, we can just go through the entire history of types, uh, which this is, will not cover. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll be focusing on, on various Erlang type systems. Again, I'm Zeeshan. Uh, I created, with a couple other people, Papers We Love, which has now become like a really kind of crazy phenomenon, I guess. Um, and we've run the New York one as well. And this talk is kind of models of Papers We Love talk. I don't get to do Papers We Love talks because I, I organize them, so I get to actually give one. Uh, so it's pretty neat. I also work at Basho Technologies. Uh, I work uh, currently on the uh, CRDT team, um, and uh, we're doing some cool work there. Won't be talking much about that. Um, so yeah. Uh, and uh, the preface here, I actually don't know very much uh, <laughs> in general. Uh, I've uh, been doing Erlang for about a year and, a year and change. Uh, my previous uh, background was in systems like uh, Clojure and Lisp. I never actually got to do everyday work with a real type system. Um, and I uh, have my, my backgrounds in, I have a music, uh, music master's degree and a film bachelor degree. So programming has been, uh, it's, it's a new world for me still. So uh, as I say in this talk, if you have thoughts and things, we can make it a little interactive. Papers you love talks, you tend to be this way. So if you, you, know, if you have a couple things you, have, you want to chime in, totally do it. It doesn't have to be like just me here all the time. So. I don't know anything, but there's a lot of people around Erlang type systems who do. Kasus, who gave a great talk yesterday. John Hughes, who gave a great talk this morning. Joe Armstrong, of course. Uh, Tobias, who's done a lot of the, the early type system papers. Maria, who's done a lot of the cool race detection stuff that's gone on in, in, in um, the mid-2000s mid to uh, 2010. And Joe DeVivo, you might have heard of him. Uh, the, the title... <laughs> The title of the talk actually comes from his post, and uh, you know he, he's uh, he's a good fan uh, of uh, type systems as well. All right, and there's a lot of other people. So I was uh, preparing this talk. I usually listen to music, um, like one song over and over and over again. And this one was the so uh, the first half of uh, Good People. Uh, there's a, that's a long tune. Your move is the, f the first single on that, and it has these lyrics that I think. Uh, some people say they're about uh, through the looking like Alice through the Looking Glass. Uh, some people say it's about um, drugs uh, and chess. Uh, it's kind of also about modeling inner process communication and relationships, right? Don't surround yourself with yourself. Move on back to square. Send something. Send some karma. Don't surround yourself time and time and time. So, you know, I was like, it's, it's a good song. It kind of gets you in the mood. All right, so uh, my first experience, I took a class in, uh, on Coursera and programming languages with Dan Grossman. How do you recommend it? And we had to do ML. It was my, that was my first experience with a strong static type system. And uh, if you look at this here, and if you're familiar with the uh, Erlang dialyzer, which I am going off that most people are to some degree, um, this kind of looks like things that you would do in dialyzer with some of your own types. Um, the one interesting thing of note, though, is even though we have that underscore value in, 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 M, in ML, and this is like a variation that I ran on uh, uh, standard ML of New Jersey, um, that underscore doesn't mean anything. That underscore means it has to be something of rank. But we don't care about it here in this pattern match. So something to keep your mind on, because things we can do in Erlang, of course, uh, that, that underscore could really be anything. And then we know in Erlang that it's a dynamically strong type language where we can't do things like this. We obviously have these runtime checks. Those things we know. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty typical for these things. Obviously, we're not talking about things like duck typing, stuff like that you would see in Ruby and whatnot. And people love talking about types and fighting about types and the wars on types. And here's just like a handful of things I pulled from Twitter. People are hope. Well, the Jane and Smith coding one's my favorite. I hope Erlang wins an Oscar for best type system. I don't know how that got generated. It's a great Markov generator. <laughs> Who asked? This? It's amazing. Um, but people have been asking for a long time. I mean, actually, what the sad thing is, actually, if you read through these tweets, and you shouldn't, uh, is that people complain. They, a lot of people still think 
like that Erlang has no type system at all, that you know, people don't even know Dialyzer exists. Or as someone said, I don't know if I, I think I didn't put that one on here, but someone said, uh, it just helps you out a little bit, uh, which is, you know, it can actually do a lot more. But uh, interesting things as well. Um, uh, VP Unpopular Things says, I would argue Erlang and Dialyzer are superior to Go's type systems. So that's, a, I think, a really interesting tidbit. And at the end here, uh, Jay Lewis talks about idea of the non-trivial problem of multi-party session typing, and we'll actually talk about that in this talk. So it's like, hint at the future. So if anyone knows Bob Harper, Bob Harper is a big person behind ML uh, and the uh, SML spec for many years, hardcore type theorist. He says dynamic typing is but a special case of static typing, uh, basically that there's that dynamic typing is just one big type, the whole program, when it runs in runtime. Uh, <laughs> one that limits rather than liberates, one that shuts down opportunities rather than opening up new ones. Um, if you hang, I have had the pleasure to have a class with Bob. He's a hardcore type theorist. Uh, I saw him in a talk at Popple, an academic uh, language thing, where there's a whole track on gradual typing. And he was sitting in it, and someone asked, so what are your thoughts on gradual typing, Bob? And Bob goes, oh, what, I wasn't paying attention. So, you know, he, you, know you, you are going to have these wars of people and people who feel certain things. Uh, and here from, uh, from one of Costas' papers, actually, is this great quote, all is fair in love and more, even trying to add a static type system to a dynamically typed programming language. So it is always going to be a war. But now we've moved into this world where we have gradual typing as kind of a normal thing. Lots and lots of languages, even JavaScript, has concepts of type systems. Uh, and actually, Flow is pretty great. And it's a great paper in itself. But uh, the term gradual typing actually didn't, was not coined until 2006. Um, and the flow of, like, uh, is Dialyzer itself a gradual type language? It is, but it, there actually is some caveats to what gradual typing, the definition, has meant over time. We won't talk about it too much in this talk. Um, but you can see that there, that it gives the programmer the ability to uh, control which regions of the code are dynamic, uh, statically or dynamically type, uh, and enables the gradual evolution of code between two typing disciplines. OK. So here's an example, actually, just of general gradual typing in one of my other favorite languages, which is Racket. Um, but Racket is probably the most known gradually typed uh, variation, type Racket is, uh, that's around. Uh, it can do all kinds of types. It's very expressive. It's composable. Um, and you still can write Lisp. And you, in Racket, you have this great module system where I can have a module within the, ra the typed Racket language or my regular code that's not. Uh, and we'll talk about something toward the end about how there's some cool things that we can think about for, uh, for Erlang type systems and, and, and some of the stuff that Racket does with contracts. But here, just a basic example, I have that distance function. I put in a, uh, the wrong type, foo. Like things, I get my type checker, my type mismatch. And we're, we're getting, you know, obviously, as Erlang programmers who hopefully use Dialyzer, um, we're pretty used to this. For other people, uh, especially people who probably who are programming uh, Lisp and program theme for many days, this is really amazing that we have this ability to do this uh, in a Lisp language. So let's talk about the past. Um, here's a couple of just uh, some brief uh, variables. You might see them throughout. I'm not doing any proofs. We're not going to do any elimination rules. We're not going to, you know, maybe later. That stuff's fun. Uh, but you have E. It's a basic expression, meaning its components fit together properly according to the rules. And then you have your tau, uh, which is basically what this type is once evaluation occurs. And you'll see tau a lot. Um, so we talk about the beginnings of the history here. We talk about type we talk about soft typing. I mean, Dialyzer itself um, and the contract system, everything built in Dialyzer is a, uh, well, not the contract system, but Dialyzer itself is a soft type system in the sense that we try to do, use inference to uh, and apply it to uh, this dynamically typed languages. So there's a lot of like, uh, really amazing work in the past. Carr, Wright, and Fagan, soft typing. Uh, Aiken and Winmers, uh, inclusion of constraints and in type inferences. Um, so the idea is that, you know, in soft, you know, in soft typing, you're removing the associated runtime dispatching. That's, that doesn't exist. And your, your focus is on st uh, statically catching type errors. That's pretty obvious. And the overall approach of them is that you normally want types to describe the form of the data supplied to it and produced by the programs. The association of types to programs is done by a set of inference rules. These are pretty much things. If you have any type system, these things apply as well. But in a soft typing approach, I give you my program, the entire program is now susceptible to inference. And that's the, the softness of it. Um, in the work that we'll get to when we talk about success types, um, principal typing was actually a huge, huge influence on the work that Costas and others have done. 
which is this idea of finding a way to represent all, oh, a little misprint there, all possible typings for a term, which this sounds like success typing, right? Um, and actually, it was this uh, early work in it as well, uh, you know, which is pretty amazing that you, you see success typing uh, even talked about things in the 80s. Um, not only is a principal type is also the associated environment, the type signature only holds the argument in the application or subtypes of the arguments of the signature. So um, in some sense, right, the environment is exported from the function to the call site. So um, it, can, it, can, it can basically look, you know, when it does, when it goes through its inference, it basically can say, I can look at all the points where we call, call these functions, these call sites, and we can use that information to help figure out what is this, this topmost type what is this principal type, which is a lot like what happens in Dialyzer. Okay, so the first like Erlang-centric type paper that I found was this master's thesis. In a, it's a truly a master's thesis in all its glory, um, <laughs> good and bad, um, by Anders Lindgren, um, where he was trying to prototype a soft type system for Erlang. So this is 1996, which is pretty crazy uh, that this was happening at the time. And, and it doesn't get too many references. Uh, mostly because it doesn't work, and I'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> um, but you look at, I mean, these things are pretty normal. Like, we have foo here, we have a cons. They actually had a cons type. This is their application to thinking of Erlang. Uh, for those not familiar, cons, you're, yeah, as you see there, you're basically consing on a list that comes from the, the days of Lisp. Um, so they have this cons type. These things are pretty normal. The sad part, like, you look at the paper, it has these examples of where it found type defects. Uh, and they're pretty much examples like we can't add true plus one, which is like, okay, I mean, you have to do that to have a paper, I imagine. Um, um, and, and, and though there's some interesting things in here, they have this idea of uh, data types that represent, they have the entire collection of data types. They have a mapping of all the types to all the type values that could exist. And then you have these uh, terms, which we'll come back to actually, uh, meet and join operation, you think of sets. You have your upper bounds and lower bounds, basically. Um, and, you know, um, the problem they ran into a little bit here, they used this previous papers from, we talked about Winmers and, uh, and Aiken earlier, they used a previous constraint solver called uh, Illyria, Greek mythology. Um, and basically, like, you know, the blame in the paper that Anders comes out with is like, this prototype does not work because the constraint solver could not do these things. Um, and they cannot do simple things like, I can't have a type that's an atom, a specific atom. Like if I have an atom that's foo and I want to match on that as a type, that could not happen. Their constraint solver could not handle that. Um, and things like it shows here. So, you know, um, int union flow, this is, this is the idea of a union type. We'll talk more about that. Um, we understand that. These are the sets, of, that's a set of all numbers. But it couldn't do things where you had a set of all numbers with the union of another int. It's kind of overlapping. It couldn't handle that. Um, so one thing really cool about the paper, though, is that it actually models send and receive. Those are really large proof rules in the paper. I, didn't, I, didn't, I was not showcasing those. Um, but you'll see, actually, that's the thing uh, we'll kind of get to in the theme that you'll kind of see is um, I was actually really surprised they were you know, trying to, to do static time interprocess inter types. Um, a lot of the other papers that come afterward in the era just avoid it altogether because they think Erlang processes are hard uh, to find types for. Um, so they don't have an annotation system. That's a big difference. They actually reference, we'll talk about the next, the, the Wadler, uh, Wadler Marlowe paper on types. They actually reference it, but they say, look, we're not trying to do annotations. There's no specs. Um, however, though, um, they tried really hard to extend the Henley-Milner uh, unification-based system for types. They tried to add all kinds of types. You have intersection types, union types, function types, constructor types. And yet, um, it couldn't actually work for a, lot of, for, a lot, for a lot of these. But the ideas were there. I mentioned at the end here is the kind of thing of first systems. Actually, Joe Armstrong and Thomas Arts worked on a system that, de that actually took, took an annotation language to generate, we uh, to generate HTML, generate web spec uh, related stuff. I could not find that paper, though, uh, and read it. But uh, it gets referenced in a couple places. OK. So this is the paper that kind of everyone talks about. If you still go on Twitter and people who are Haskell people, uh, and people from all these other strong set of type languages, they'll be like, oh, didn't Marlowe and Wilder try to do a type system for Erlang? I guess they failed. It's never gonna, we're never going to have a type system in Erlang, even though they don't know the actual history. And, and Marlowe and Wilder's work is actually it's pretty amazing. This is uh, June 97 at ICFP when they released it. 
Um, and uh, yeah, a little bit of the history of the story and, and Joe's uh, history of Erlang paper is like Waller had a year of sabbatical and he's like, I'm going to add types to Erlang. Joe, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> and uh, they're based it on some of the same work that we saw in the previous paper. Um, and it has, this, it has supportive recursive types and disjoint unions, which we'll talk about in, my, in the next slide. Um, it had a type annotation system, which looks kind of like dialyzer, like we know it as today. Um, and it, had, it brought about the idea of subtyping. So the idea is, and uh, my next slide actually shows the difference between subtyping and, uni and, and unification. But um, subtyping is what we know is, is a big part of dialyzer. And this paper does bring that about. Um, and then they had these constraints where they, you know, the whole point of what they do is that they want to reject code. And we'll sh I'll show you some examples. So subtyping is, is basically a way to solve sets of constraints in this form. And you'll see this uh, throughout. The it's basically like a subset. Um, and I have an image of what subtyping is. And if you know Java, you know you have a cat, you have an animal, you know something about subtyping. <laughs> uh, so unification um, is what the Henley Milner type systems are really about, where everything has to match um, in, the entire, uh, in the entire spec, uh, which is very different from what sub subtyping means. Um, so unification based systems, they, um, they are obviously less strict, uh, they're obviously more strict than subtyping. Subtyping is much more generalized. So the example above is a, is a really simple idea that we know of as a, as a subtype. So for example, like in Ruby, uh, everything is a subtype of the object, and you, you can basically have subtypes of subtypes of subtypes. Um, and the bottom here is actually the subtype system for dialyzer, uh, where you have your uh, any, which is your uh, the most upper bound, and you have none, which is your least upper bound. If you hit none, in Dialyzer and, and, and actually in, in, in Wather system as well, if you hit none, then you have a type conflict. You have an error. But obviously in, in Wather and Marlowe's paper, they're more akin to some like, old school ideas. They, they want to change the way you write um, code. They're going to reject your programs, unlike something we get in success, success typing. So the one part I wanted to bring back is at the end there. Uh, this is actually from Joe Armstrong's History of Erlang. They had disappointing results from, from Wather's work. Um, so a couple of the key things was it only worked on a subset of Erlang. Uh, and probably the biggest thing is that they completely miss uh, anything to do with send, receive, and processes. They completely say, it's trivial, probably later. We're not going to deal with it, which uh, it's obviously not very trivial. <laughs> um, OK. Or it's obviously, yeah. So, um, so some things we talked about just to get some of the, the vocabulary right. So unification is, is the process of looking at each of the constraints and trying to find a single type that satisfies all of them. So like the unified two type expressions define substitutions for all those variables and make them identical. And in a lot of the work, the, like one of the other influences, again, papers upon papers upon papers, is this Wright Cartwright uh, thing where they actually tried to apply um, an early version of soft typing for scheme. Uh, it wasn't until we had things like type racket and the work they did for, uh, for doctor scheme later that actually became the type system that we see now. Um, but they were trying to do the same thing where they were trying to do subtyping with union types. Okay, so in the Wather paper, this is actually like, a, I think, the great example. This is like the example that tends to be used on where it, it kind of doesn't follow through. Hey, Costas, how's it going? Good to see you. <laughs> um, so at the top there, um, that's pretty much like what this spec would look like in, in the dialyzer in Erlang. The bottom one there is uh, from um, the Wather paper, where it's just the idea of this, this uh, uh, variable x uh, that could be any type. Now, in the Wather paper, they, again, have subtypes. And they, have, they come out, when, when they run this, they have the any type and false gets their thing. And I'll show how they do that, because they basically they, you know, they didn't use like something like Core Erlang. They had their own, uh, they had their own uh, representation that they went to, where pattern matches became uh, case statements. But see, in a, in a Henley Milner system, this would be bool comma bool to bool, right? That it has to be, it has to be a boolean value. Otherwise, we're going to reject the program. Wather and, and Marlowe, like you'll see a lot in the practical stuff in Costas's work, they did, they did say in the beginning of the paper, we want to make it where it's not hard for uh, Erlang programmers to move to this system. Uh, but when you look at that, you look at and, any, and false being your type here, when you actually don't, when actually you probably, and, I mean, may, you, the programmer probably doesn't want this, but um, in your and, you might want to allow a float to be on the right-hand side because that's a general variable. 
this seems weird. And, and for them, even in the paper, they say, this seems really weird. So this is an example of how that end case finds false as the second one. And it's mostly due to, the, it's basically uh, specific to that case statement of why there and how it, how it figures out the variables. Okay. Um, but this, this is like me running it in typer, this is the spec that we imagine which goes to the, the least upper bound of this, which the, the underscore just means any. This means an any dilator type. This is what we know. So that's a pretty, it's a pretty different idea there um, when you have to have that false in the, in the second value. OK. Uh, so uh, right kind of before dialyzer hits, this is around the same time, 2002, 2003, in terms of papers, uh, kind of being worked on the same time, uh, Nystrom had a soft typing system for Erlang. This was, yeah, 2003 Erlang workshop. Um, he used this concept of data flow analysis to compute for each variable and sub-expression in the program. It did, you know, like most systems, it generated type expression and tried to match against those expressions with the solver. Um, it had concepts for polymorphism. It had uh, type um, specifications uh, around abstract types, public types, unsafe types. Obviously, uh, Java and things were, were like influential at the time. He wanted to showcase to people that we have these ideas, uh, especially the public type. Um, but like they say, and this is like a common theme for a while, it turns out that specifying the interaction of an Erlang process is rather difficult. So they just skip it again. We're just, eh, let's not worry about it. Um, uh, and I said, it has it. But one thing it does, and compared as we get to the dollar stuff, it has a tons of noise because you have to annotate at these specific inter interface points, especially if you're using something like a public, the, the public type or whatnot. So you have to annotate those things. And as we get into... Um, uh, all right, one more paper before we get into dialyzer. But as dialyzer comes in, your, you know, the, the initial scope of it before we had contracts, it was basically like we're going to completely use inference for the whole thing. It's completely soft type. You don't have to worry about annotations. Uh, no one really ended up ever using the system, and that's what also the dialyzer paper says. I, I haven't found any use cases of the system in action, and obviously it's not in use now. Um, so around the same time, or 2002 actually, um, is this uh, kind of prototype idea um, by John Hughes and co. here called Typing Erlang. Um, I kind of randomly came across it toward the end. But it asks this question, uh, how do we ensure that the receive expressions in a process body expect messages of the correct type? So here's the beginning where, um, though again, the, the Lindgren paper actually does try to model uh, send and receive. Um, it didn't really ask too many questions about it. But here you have uh, John Hughes and Typing Erlang talking about it. And this idea of I have an expression, I have a type, and I have this uh, mu, this what, am I, what is it receiving? What is the effect of the, of the type of the message I'm receiving? So results and message types are associated. Um, and they modeled it under this idea of existential types, which are types that represent modules and records. Um, and they talk about, in the paper, the idea of using a unique identifier with make ref, with a unique process, which comes back later when we talk about session typing, actually. Um, as you see there. Uh, the, yeah. Okay. So the tau of now. So uh, you have 2004, you have this paper, The War Story, um, the basically the beginning of, uh, of, of Dialyzer here. And actually, it's really great. I mean, some of the other papers, you're kind of going in and about, roundabout, and I see a lot of relationships to work in scheme types and whatnot. But as the dialyzer papers come through, and I was telling Costas this last night, it, as they come through, there's kind of a lineage of the work that's happening. As you, you get the, the first paper, you get the experience papers, you go into contracts, you go into detecting race conditions. It kind of just keeps building on each other. Um, so, you know, these are probably, the, in the initial paper, it wasn't using, it wasn't, you know, do, doing anything with Core Erlang at the time. It actually had this I code, byte code translation. Um, with the control flow graph. Um, it did have the idea of local analysis versus a persistent lookup table, which is what we still know of, that dash PLT, right? Um, it adapted, and it was a big thing. It's practical. It adapts to Erlang code style. Um, it never generates false alarms, false positives, uh, which is a key thing. Uh, and it's sound for defect detection. You know, people will, uh, in type systems will fight over what sound this is. Uh, in this case, it is truly sound for defect, det uh, for defect detection. Okay, so here is the, some of the, the, an image of, from the paper with the, the control flow graph, where you have the Erlang code on the left, 
you have this without optimization one. And because they can figure out that we don't need to, to hit all these points in the graph, we can, we can collapse things, we have the one with, with optimization there. Okay. Um, so kind of in this like, trajectory of papers, you have the kind of uh, uh, more academic like paper on, on the system, the static analysis themselves, and then you, you know, uh, Koss has done a lot of work where you ha and team uh, of these experience papers. Um, so here, here's one of the first ones, and there's a great quote that comes out of it, I think, uh, that I got out of it. I love that. So in talking about dynamic programming uh, and, and why dialyzer is modeled to A, be backwards compatible with all that Erlang code again, uh, and to not, not change the characteristics of the programmer, um, is that, that programmers who write with dynamic types have this la laissez-faire style of programming, which I think is, you know, I, 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 like, I hope to consider myself that kind of person. So I think it's pretty great. Uh, but what it really relates to is a policy uh, of letting things take their own course, not intervening with your work. And it's up to you how much you want to go. Okay, so uh, 2005, we get Typer. Uh, so Typer has the ability to, that, to actually give us specs. Um, and uh, I'll show, I have an example here, yeah. So, uh, you know, these are some simple files. Um, you know, uh, we never at Basho, for example, unfortunately, we never, we still have so many things, so many modules lacking types. But for some reason, we never use Typer and actually just inject the types in. I don't know why we don't do that. I'm thinking about doing it now. It might be scary, I don't know. Um, but in Typer, um, you know, obviously it comes about the importance of what uh, Dialyzer's main, uh, main work is with static analysis is this idea of disjoint unions, um, which is what we know of most of the time is what, we're th you know, what we do uh, work in Dialyzer with when we, when we write specs or, or let the system infer it itself. So what that means is the type is the greatest lower bound of its subtype constraints. So we saw that graph earlier. We had any at the top of the lattice, and you had none at the bottom of the lattice, right? None, again, is when you actually have a type conflict. Um, so lo the lower bound of the subtype constraints. Um, but then when you solve this disju disjunction, so in this case here, I have the tau of x, which is a value 42 and an output of true. And I have a disjunction here without and false. So I know that my output is going to be a Boolean value, because in, these, in this uh, disjunction, I can, either, I can either have an output of true or false. But my input can be 42, or in the case of the other one, it could be something else. Um, so the way Dialyzer works on this is that, again, it has all these, these disjunctive unions where you solve the types, the, sub, the types within the subtype constraints first with a lower bound, and then when you do the, the comparison, is this going to be a number or a value or something else, then you, uh, then you, do, you basically use this disjunction to find the least upper bound. So in this case here, in these types, it could be 42 or any, and then bool, right? OK, so this is if the ideas of like upper bounds in a set. This is like set theory stuff. Um, the least upper bound within the constraints themselves. And we'll show more examples of actual code to, to make that uh, specific. Yeah. Um, so uh, in the Typer paper, there's a lot of talk about, again, uh, never rejecting programs accepted by Beam. Um, that type inference is compositional. This is the big difference between the Wobbler and Marlowe work as well. Um, and then in this paper is the first time that like, the term success typings really gets used, and there's a whole paper on it. We'll show, show that next. Uh, so you find the most general success type, typings under constraints. It uses the data flow analysis to find more refined types. So this is, this is like the, you know, if you have the export a function, in the case in the top one there, I have the export uh, with tag. Being that I export main there and I can call in the tag, I can have a more refined spec than in the bottom case where I have when I'm using fun tag, because that could be, that could be used anywhere. OK. And again, bottom types, none, or in, the, in really the case, no return is what you should use, and according to documentation. That's, uh, if you don't, if you want to let something pass, you use no return. But in the case of when the, inf and the inferer runs through, if it hits none or hits no return, that's when you know you're, you have no solutions in the solver. So this is like the big paper, I think, that brings up the term success typings, uh, though the previous one does it, but this is like the one. This is PBDP 2006. Um, so uh, in cases here, you know, the whole idea is that uh, I think the quote from the paper is, never trying to outsmart the programmer. Uh, and in this case, this is a good example, is that we think length, it's the length of a list. It has to be a list. It has to be a list type. 
but not in this case, because I can pass, three, I can pass pi into n, and I've got to let that go. And there's a, there's a, you know, some people find that scary, but there's a beauty to it. And obviously, the more you add specs, the more you add types, the more refined they be, the better, the better annotations you get, the better type system you get. Uh, and this is the paper where they talk about the move to core Erlang as well, uh, which allows, uh, which allows uh, obviously, uh, more integration with the Erlang ecosystem. Um, and then they can do things with uh, using actually let rec and let, uh, which, gets, uh, which is like a, the core part of core Erlang, as you see here in the IR. You know, if anyone's ever done stuff with core Erlang before, it's pretty fun. Uh, list favorite Erlang, for example, runs in the core Erlang uh, before it gets uh, down to beam. But it's just an immediate representation that has very specific things. There's no uh, pattern matching, just fits in the cases as well. Um, and you have these idea of let and let rec, where you can actually uh, specify scope, scoping rules this way. Okay. Uh, and from that paper, this is a great quote, we are, uh, we are instead interested in capturing the biggest set of terms for which we can be sure that type clashes will definitely occur. Um, instead of keeping track of this set, we will design an algorithm that infers this complement of function success typing. Success typing the type signature that over approximates a set of types for which the function can evaluate. So this idea of over approximation is the key. Okay? So, and, and, and that's kind of like always a thing. Again, it's not going to outsmart you. Yeah, and the idea of the constraint solver in the paper is really interesting because the idea is to solve all constraints in a conjunction until either a fixed point is reached or until you hit the type class when you hit none, like I talked about before. Again, if you use Dialyzer, you might have seen this, but underneath the hood, um, it basically create, it use, has constraint generation and a solver, and this is what the solver does. Okay, uh, in this paper, it brings about some stuff how to deal with termination. So, uh, for example, if I, uh, uh, as I go, if, uh, as it's infracing, and it, it tries to figure out uh, in the traversal of like, I have maybe many, many, many kinds of union types. There is a limit to how far you go. Um, and there's this idea of the, the depth k, which is, um, it, you know, uh, you have a fixed point for you can't grow larger than any k, otherwise abstract to an any type. So there's a point where, as it goes through, especially if you think of like uh, some of the uh, recursive types, uh, you can imagine where you need to say stop because you want the program to terminate. Uh, yeah, the system to terminate. So, um, and in first success types of the functions by analyzing its nodes, which are called strongly connected components. Um, and there's a talk in the paper about types, which were mentioned back in the 96 paper, they were trying to do conditional types and intersection types, but uh, these were not done at the time. Um, and here's just an example of where things, where you start getting, where you use guards and whatnot to then have, to have these, these types as well. And these are things that we've seen. The bottom is just the formula, the formula logic for it, where you say for every alpha, uh, if I have an integer with a subset of another integer and an atom, where I have this guard. So you basically, the guards can just act as uh, subtyping rules as well. Okay. So uh, in 2007 is when you get to actually having uh, the ability for the user to add specs. And this is like, I, I could have just done the whole talk with this, right? Like I thought it would have been really great. <laughs> so you have what success typing is, this kind of restrictive idea. You have dynamic typing, which is what we know about. And you have success typing, which is even an over approximate of, it's like over approximation of dynamic typing, which is like pretty amazing. Um, so the idea of the success typing domain is used in upper bound of the argument types of, at the call site, right? It's the, it's, the most, it's the most upper bound that you can get of these. So, um, kind of actually going through this paper is really interesting as well because you get uh, some, some things that have changed that the specs look a little different than they do now that we're used to. Uh, but uh, as, like here I have the is subtype logic, which uh, is actually uh, depre uh, deprecated now. You're supposed to use the colon colon, which is what I have at the top. Um, but you see here, um, you can even specify with subtypes like this. So in this uh, purposely errored code that I wrote, uh, for, an increment, for an increment of, of a number type, um, I say, but give x input of x, so you, it's a uh, parametrized, parametrized type, x returns x, but that x should be a subtype of atom. Obviously, that's not true in the actual code. This is running it through typer, and typer gives me the inferred signature, a number to a number. So contracts, which is what they're called, and you know, I think it's pretty great because like, I've always thought of it as, as I came into Erlang, you know, we, specs, annotations. But contracts themselves is a huge thing, and obviously in the, in the scheme and racket world, that's everything is called contracts. Um, but a lot of the work they're doing is around contracts, and there's a lot of new work on contracts. Um, but here is actually the paper where we have the ability to have, uh, we have function types, we have polymorphic contracts, 
Um, you know, I always thought this one in the Erlang docs is really great, where you, you, you have the ID of x returns an x, returns, whatever, returns the same x, where that x is the tuple, which means it has to return the same tuple. Uh, it's, it's a dummy example, but I always think it's kind of fun that these things do. I mean, it's actually really sad, because I was going through this talk, and you know, at Basho we have a lot of Erlang, and not only do we maybe lack some, spe you know, we lack some specs, we lack, um, uh, you know, we, we throw away third-party dependencies all the time because we don't want to work with those, and we, or even some of our own sub-libraries. But actually, I think modeling uh, these polymorphic contracts would be really, really great, and we should do more of that. Uh, I don't see that in much Erlang code, actually, and it's actually pretty powerful. Um, so, and the same idea, we have uh, contract overloading, right? So, uh, you can do things there where, you, again, those guards match, but I can, my contract can take these multiple types. And you can, you can either make that, you can obviously make that pretty, uh, pretty refined. But this allowed for, for obviously more uh, refining. And then you have another experience report on the work on Wrangler, where here you tested real objects, uh, exposing their type information, um, and, and working through the process, right? So the same thing you should do is you go through your Erlang code, you should start, you have, you know, you have Dialyzer, it's gonna do the inference for you, but you also should then start adding guards where you can add guards, Export, you know, be good about your exporting and what you want to export so that to help the data flow analysis. Uh, but then in this paper, as, 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 they, as Casas does, he works through the adding type declarations and contracts to get the most refined version of, of, uh, of the Wrangler code that they can. So in uh, Evan's talk at the keynote, uh, so this is like a, a paper that I, I was kind of, I didn't, I came by, I was kind of surprised by. Uh, and now I'm going a little bit out of order because there's some, some cool stuff with race condition detection that comes uh, that comes before this paper, but I, I think in order it makes more sense to showcase it like this. Uh, so we saw uh, Evan's talk, where this, and he has a great post called Compilers as Assistants. So, you know, there's a thought of why can't type systems also have be assistants as well, and Peter Norvig has talked about this a bunch. So there's this paper, which is not, which is like you, is not used, it's not used as like main part of, you know, when you, when you download Dialyzer now, there is a version of it that you can download. This is the idea of program slicing. Um, so to give you an example first, and I'll define it, uh, but we see we have this function here, um, which is going to have an error. Um, but, so dialyzer, if you look at the top parts, it says the pattern one can never match, the variable y can never match. Those are things that dialyzer will normally give you. But when they were working with program slicing, it's still like kind of a prototype on stuff, but you have this ability to get the lineage of where the erroring would have went wrong. And program slicing is a thing. I don't even know much about it until I went through this for this talk, and I'm like, I really want to do a lot more research on it. It's really interesting. Uh, and what it, you know, it's like from Wikipedia. It's a, a computation, a set of programs, statements, the program slice that may affect the value of some point of interest. Um, and we, they call that the slicing criterion. And usually, program slicing is used for debugging, which uh, makes complete sense why you might want to use it in something like, a, like Dialyzer. Um, so uh, the next graph shows the, the system they built for it in that paper, but basically you have to label all the parts of the function, uh, and they have this labeling done as a, a kind of version of a labeled core Erlang. So this is the, the, the entire compilation process that's around this paper. And this, is a, this is a pretty dense paper, by the way. It was actually of like all of them, I think, one of, one of the densest. But also I didn't have much uh, knowledge beforehand on, on this. But Erlang, core Erlang, you have that labeling component, which, which is on core Erlang. Uh, you have the, you know, you have your generation. This is all typical stuff that we see in Dialyzer, but except for this part after the constraint solving, where you have these slices, and then you refine these slices because um, if once you have an error, um, so that's like the third phase, right? The 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 parameterized program slicing. Once you have a set of errors, you don't want to throw, you don't want to give back the entire line, lineage of all the all the all the code that would have been within that error. You want to you want a refined type of only the lines of code that affect uh, the error uh, the error type conflict. Which again, in this case here, it's not every line of code from here that we get back. We get we get back only those that were labeled and specific to the type class. Okay, um, so in a lot of the in a lot of these papers, and I think the really interesting theme that kind of came about for me was that we were moving. I, yeah, there's some stuff around stem receive uh, and processes types across processes. Again, you see some of the papers. Uh, uh, the earlier papers kind of just go, this is too hard, this is too difficult. Um, so then you start getting some work where uh, even uh, Casas and team, uh, and Maria here, who's doing a lot of great work, where they're trying to do, uh, trying to detect things uh, around race conditions. This is in 2011. 
And there is this option, right, with race conditions that you can have on. I was surprised to look at uh, Basho code where we actually removed that from our entire build system. We have a build system with Dialyzer, but race conditions was gone uh, for actually React CS. Uh, and the reason uh, was I looked, you know, I was like, oh, archaeology here, look at some history. And the reason was uh, it took too long, which before I explain what it does, I mean, I think uh, it's basically, if you look in the docs, it has this. Uh, which is uh, include warnings for possible race conditions. Note that the analysis that finds data races performs intraprocedural data flow analysis that can sometimes explode in time. Enable it at your own risk. So, uh, you know, now you know, right? So, <laughs> um, but it dealt with things because when you think of uh, how to type, uh, especially in, they're trying to do this in static, uh, in statically, how to type things uh, around send and receives. And, and, and the paper specifically focuses on this idea of receives with no messages, receives with the wrong kind, receives with unnecessary patterns. So th that's actually not that harmful, right? Like a, a receive where you have, a, you have a, pattern, uh, a pattern match that doesn't do anything. I mean, it doesn't really hurt you. It's just kind of bad programming practice. And the send nowhere receives where um, you, uh, you know, the, the PID is no longer there. It may, not, may no longer be there. Um, so it collects pairs of programs, points possibly involved in a race condition, um, and it basically does this context, uh, this, this uh, graph traversal, and, and, and does this extra work, and what probably also takes some of the performance down is that there are some clauses, some weird things where, like in this case with this receive, <coughs> where it actually, in the initial version of the program before filtering, uh, found, that this is a, that found that this receive might block. Um, there, therefore, it might be a race condition when it actually isn't. So it does extra work to filter out these false alarms because it's the overall premise of everything. You have to filter out the false alarms, and uh, therefore, uh, you have this extra work, which uh, does increase performance uh, issues as well. Okay. Uh, so you, we have these thoughts. Uh, there's a lot of other work around testing. Uh, Concur, which is also out of Costas' group and Maria's work as well. Model checking tools. We have, we have polls for random scheduling. So we're thinking about concurrency. So this, the last part I'll go over here in the last five minutes is this idea around session typing. Uh, so they were designing the idea of like the pi calculus. That's, that's a whole talk in itself how that works. Um, but the pi calculus was created by, uh, was created by Milner in 92 um, and coined that way as a, a calculus of mobile processes. And when I brought it up to a friend of mine, they were like, no, there's no way they're talking about mobile technology. And they're not talking about mobile technology. They're talking about the idea of like anything that's a mobile process, though. They're, they were thinking this far ahead of, of now we look at the work that Chris was talking about, let's say, with uh, we're focusing at the edge. Um, so the idea of session types, they, 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 the links between process can be sent, sent between processes. So um, you have this, uh, they're basically protocols uh, that determine how nodes communicate to each other. And they, they're based on these concepts around linear logic, which is I can send a channel at most one time, exactly one time, because if I send it again, I break, I break things. And, and Basically, in the system we'll talk about in Erlang, they reject things like that from occurring. There were two papers on it. There was one called Session Typing for a Featherweight Erlang. And again, the session types is a lot of things on session types, by the way. It's a whole talk in itself. But these are the focus on the Erlang ones. And Featherweight Erlang had this idea of correlation sets, and they needed unique references. And I'll show you as we talk about uh, quickly how, the, how communication gets processed. Um, but the idea is if I have A and I have B, and I want to create a session for those things that they can only communicate with certain messages to each other. Um, you need a unique identifier to make sure that if node C comes my way and I'm participating with B in a specific communication process, C comes in, I want to make sure that I know where, did, did that process come from B or C? I am only, I'm only working with B, I'm not working with C. So they tried to, they used the idea of having a make reference and identifier, which goes all the way back to John Hughes's uh, discussion of using make reference and identifier in his like types uh, idea which is really interesting. Problem with this paper, it only deals with binary sessions. So only A to B, only B to C. But, not, but in Erlang, as we, you know, as we model processes, many, many nodes can talk to each other. We think in, in React, for example, nodes fall, there's fallbacks, there's primaries, things come in and out. We have to, you know, how do you deal with that? So this paper, uh, thesis actually, by Simon Fowler at Edinburgh, was really, really great uh, around session types. And he actually created this kind of dialect of Erlang called Monitored Session Erlang. It's on GitHub, I recommend playing with it. Um, and it basically has this idea that monitors are first class, that we can, uh, we can view uh, processes in, in the runtime uh, using monitors. And basically, the, the main key for this is that monitor networks are rejection based. If I get a message I'm not supposed to get, I just reject it from getting in the mailbox. Okay? 
And he answers this question, and the, and the thesis is really great, which is, Erlang's communication patterns, as beautiful as they are and as, as uh, open as they are, are informally defined. How can we do a logic to, to do that? So they use a system called Scribble. This is actually back, we're bringing back. Philip Wather comes back, uh, and a big, big team. And they're doing, they have this thing called ABCD. It's a, it's a work with uh, people at companies, people in academia. And they're working, they have this thing called Scribble as one of, one of the things that they're working on where you can have this DSL um, configuration system for inter-process communication uh, you know, um, configuration. So here's a simple ping pong example. I have ping from A to B, pong from B to A. This is my global protocol for how the, how the two nodes will work. And then each uh, local node gets a ping, uh, has their own. It's only going to ping to B and pong from B, right? And the same thing goes for, for uh, the local protocol here. OK, here's like a, a larger protocol. And these actually look like finite state machines. They're actually called commu uh, uh, commu communication finite state machines. Uh, and as you see here, this is a, this is a much a bigger example, the buyer-seller example, is that you can have choices. So a node can say, when I talk to this node in a session, if I get this, have this choice, do this. Or do this, or do this, otherwise terminate, or otherwise continue in this session that I'm, I'm, I'm working on. Uh, the paper itself goes into the stuff where uh, how they do the unique identif identification again. They couldn't just use make ref, for example. So they have this three tuple that is the reference, the, the process ID, and the role. So nodes can play roles. So again, uh, the one that I didn't mention, we, we looked at binary session types. But this is actually multi-party session types. So A and B and C. But these can have different roles in different sessions. So if I'm a node that is only there to uh, process JSON, let's say, and I, I can be in a session with nodes A, B, and C to do that work in parallel, and how, how to communicate that, that. But I can also be a node that's participating in some sort of form of anti-entropy. That's a different session. And we can model these things at different sessions. And any time we hit a failure, especially in, in the case of monitored session Erlang, it's not, we're not going to break the system. We're not going to fall down. We're just going to reject the things that don't fit the protocol. And this is kind of the really awesome thing about session types. And that's uh, just how the, like, the initiator process. The paper really gets very long. It's 130 pages, but highly recommend it. So uh, to conclude here, so what patterns do we see? Um, we started with, we want type systems. Uh, people were like, well, uh, at the same time, everybody was trying to get uh, soft type systems around dynamically typed languages. Erlang came around, too. Uh, then you had you know, actually really good work by, by obviously, Costas and team to actually make that. You know, the biggest thing is why people use Dialyzer compared to these other systems, they integrated in the system. They, they made it work. And it's easy when people can just go, wait, can I just try it? It works, of course. I mean, that's a uh, user interface uh, 101, right? Um, but you see the, the through line kind of goes, uh, we get type inference is the main thing. We get specs. Um, then we start looking at, um, obviously, opening the types as well. Then we start looking at concurrency. Uh, how to process those things. And everybody was kind of trying to model that stuff way back when. Then uh, some of the work kind of went toward model checking and test uh, for concurrency and doing this work, which is really great work as well. But it's interesting now that we're moving to the idea of uh, how, to, how to use types uh, to, to model processes, uh, types that we think of types, which is different than model checking and test. So um, basically, the session types, you can imagine for things that like Chris talked about in selective hearing, if I have, an ep I have this epidemic broadcast protocol, this gossip, but I want to make sure that when certain nodes come up, they, they don't participate in something. We can reject those nodes from even initiating a session sequence. So things can play roles. This is really, really interesting work. And I, I really recommend Fowler's work. It's, it's really amazing. Um, the other thing I want to think about is that we move into this thing. So uh, Racket has this really amazing thing between types and contracts where um, if I am in a, a module that I write specs for, but, uh, and I'm, I'm really sure about my types, but then I bring in a library, like the, maybe like Racket's uh, document library as they have. I bring in this third party, um, which has no specs on it, no contracts associated with it. Um, and it, and, and this is optional typing, right? So we might not even have inference on for that. But if I call one of those functions from that third party in, in my, in my Mac Racket module and it fails, Racket will do this thing where even if I'm typed, instead of getting a type there because the, other, the module doesn't have it, it will give, uh, it will give a, uh, a contract error. So one of the things I see in dialers that we don't do very well is like we try to you know, not work with other dependencies. We skip them, uh, or we only work with the ones that we trust, uh, because the type errors can, can be everywhere. 
but they have a really good system where it can tell you where the contract breaks in, those specific, in that specific instance in that third party module. So that's something we could actually work on as well. So between that and the session typing, I think uh, it'd be work out really well. So that's uh, everything, the history of, of Erlang type systems, I think, up till now, and, and some really interesting things going forward. I mean, Simon Fowler's work is like 2015, and he just like, put it in for, <laughs> for candidacy, and he's doing a PhD starting up. Uh, I'll put the slides available. There are many, many links on here. I did not forget anybody. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I think we have time for a couple questions. Can you go back everyone to the questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. And you be able to like link the link. Yeah, let me have a few minutes. Uh, Any questions? Yes, yeah. Yeah, and they get mentioned in the early soft typing papers. Yeah. They get kind of randomly referenced and like, I think uh, in the feces and stuff, uh, they get mentioned. But yeah, uh, it, it, I think, I mean, there's a big thing uh, with not publishing, right? Um, and why papers we love exist. Uh, for example, uh, having an argument with a good friend of mine, David Nolan, about, uh, I, w I went to a talk at uh, uh, ICFP about, um, this idea of like uh, monotonic transitive change from from uh, 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 separate memory process to a shared memory one for performance gains they were doing in Haskell, and you know Clojure for example has had this in a long time after Phil Bagwell contributed some work for them uh, to Rich Hickey. but they never had a paper. I mean Bagwell's paper is on there with the ideal hash free stuff, but um, um, there's not too much in it because it's, it, it's the idea they're transients in Clojure if you ever use them they're really great. But there's no discussion about these things. And it's just, that's, that's the hard part sometimes. At the same time, a lot of people in the industry are not reading papers per se, and they use it in these systems. And it, it, people are not kind of always following up. And you know, at functional programming conferences in academia, a lot of it's about what happened in Haskell now. But actually, Haskell, for all its amazing things, it's an amazing language, there, it's not always the freshest on every idea, right? So, yeah. Anyone else? Does which does the uh, last example, one? For example, let's say uh, let's say you have no Yeah. Yeah. But that's two gap classes. One has two assignments and one has three assignments. Right. And you have the assignments in F, for example, if you have an issue. But for example, if there is no new function in two assignments, I could just call the handle with error and it won't care if it's F or seven F or something like this, right? Um I mean, you could, like, I mean, in something like a runtime system, like session types, you could actually write that spec out. Yeah, like something like that, you could do it. Because again, it's, it's completely about monitoring the runtime, for example. So that's, because that's not, it's not, you know, I think there's a thing that we, we, we want all the static type system stuff, which is true, but actually you can do, you can have type systems in the runtime. Uh, newer type systems in the runtime, right? Well, uh, I mean, yeah, but, and, and the work on the race condition stuff is really good. Uh, I think it's a really cool paper. I mean, but obviously, the work in Concur is, kind of went to a different direction and but does the model checking, which is really great. But session typing is probably the closest thing I've seen to doing types uh, around, uh, around the idea of, uh, of inter-process communication, at least that I've seen. I mean, it seems to be like a lot of the focus, yeah. 